CIC is today the world's largest concentration of startups. We have about a thousand startups under our roofs. Uh, we are founded here in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, this is still our largest facility next to MIT. Uh, we're also in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, next to Washington University of St. Louis. We're working with the University of Miami in Miami. Uh, and we recently opened in our first overseas office in the Netherlands, uh, close to where Delft and Erasmus and Leiden University are in Rotterdam. If you look at the longer term pattern, definitely investment in startups and new businesses has been growing steadily. More and more of the economy is in small organizations. Uh, I think that there's a realization in large businesses that uh, it's difficult to really do groundbreaking innovation within an existing organization. Uh, if you make cars, you're good at making the kinds of cars you've made before. It's hard to come up with a Tesla within your existing organization. So what I think we're seeing is a greater recognition of the role that startups play in society, bringing new ideas to the table. I believe that entrepreneurship, how we're doing entrepreneurship is changing. So I think that we're finding that communities of entrepreneurs make the individual entrepreneurs' businesses more successful. Uh, a typical entrepreneur is looking for investment, they're looking to hire people to join their firm. They're looking for introductions to potential customers. This is the lifeblood of what makes a startup successful. And when you think about it, it's, it's kind of obvious that if you're around a lot of other people who are doing similar kinds of things, who are well connected and involved in entrepreneurship, they're going to be able to give you introductions, open doors uh, for more investment, for people you might hire, for customers you might meet. Uh, this function, if you will, of bringing community to entrepreneurship is relatively new. I think the world just stumbled across it. Maybe we're a more trusting world than we were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Maybe that's part of it, I'm not sure. But what I do know is that in other fields, this notion of coming together and working close together, it has been very successful for professionals. Japan is going through a transformation right now from an industrial economy to a knowledge economy. Uh, the Japanese have historically been amazingly successful in creative business people. They have dominated many global industries, with Japan being the, the absolute top of those global industries. As we move into a knowledge era, there's a new set of skills that Japan needs to develop. It's done it before, it will do it again. Uh, but I think it's important for Japan to wrap its head, if you will, around what big data's potential is. Uh, much in the way it figured out manufacturing in the post-war era. I think the opportunities in Japan are met much like the opportunities in the United States and in Europe, with the difference that in the United States and Europe, people have been focused on this a bit longer and a bit more intensively. And as a result, there are opportunities in Japan that are untapped. I think this conference will open the possibilities to many people of what how big data can be used in Japan. One of the things we've seen over and over again is that the Japanese have the patience to really engineer terrific solutions. Uh, oftentimes there will be a, an idea or an invention, let's say that it's uh, you know portable music, I think that uh, Philips may have in invented the, the portable cassette, uh, and yet Making that really work for, for millions of people all over the world required a tremendous amount of thoughtful engineering and refinement. Uh, Japan has had a strong ability to do that. Uh, in big data, I think we're still at the frontier where we're beginning to discover the applications. We're kind of saying, oh, gee, we can have a car. And the next phase of big data will be to take it from we can have a car to we have a really good car that doesn't break, uh, that doesn't cost too much, that gets where you want it to go reliably. And I think that that's uh, the, the, probably the next wave in big data, and I think that's an area that Japan will have a big role. We're working on a couple of things. One of the challenges for us is how do we take the success we've had here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a couple other cities in the United States and apply those to other cities around the world? Uh, the world's cities are innovating, and we have a, an approach, innovation communities, concentrated workplaces for startups where there's a lot of interaction and connection and collaboration. Uh, we would like to take that approach to a number of other important cities around the world. One of the cities that we're looking at very closely right now is Tokyo. Japan has a history of one of the most creative business uh, economies in the world. Uh, the Japanese have dominated numerous global industries. Uh, there are not many countries that can say that. Uh, today we think that uh, the Japanese are in a process of discovering what's next for Japan. We'd like to be there at the ground floor. If you look at the history of the university, 
uh, research was originally done in you know, the private mansion of a wealthy Englishman where he does his experiments. Uh, famously, Nikolai Tesla did all of his experiments in his home, right, in the mountains, separated from everyone else. That's just not how we do research anymore. We do it in universities, these world-class institutions that you find all over the world. We think that that same pattern will apply to entrepreneurship, and we think that every major innovation city, of which Tokyo is clearly one, will have a large concentration, at least one large concentration of innovators and entrepreneurs similar to a CIC. Uh, we are looking forward to building that in those cities. Ideally, what we'd like to do is build one of those in each of the major innovation cities around the world and then bring them together, connect them, so that the work is being done locally, but the connections are being made globally. We're seeing that successful startups in the United States and in Europe don't seem to be principally made up of people originally from those countries. Uh, there's some research that shows that something like 50% of U.S. successful venture-backed startups have at least one founder who's a non-U.S. founder. Right? Uh, we see the same in Europe. Uh, we see the, some of the companies that have moved into our space in the Netherlands, when you talk to the people, well, they're really Irish or they're really from uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, so I think we, we have this um, experience that innovation is becoming a global game. Uh, and uh, I think in Japan, one of its weaknesses is that it has historically been very monocultural. Uh, there's no, the Japanese have a wonderful and very powerful culture, but it, it looks at things from one angle. And I think a strength for Japan in the future will be to bring entrepreneurs and innovators from other parts of the world as collaborators, as partners, so that new businesses are, are gaining the benefit of a perspective from multiple angles. Tesla, famously uh, one of the most successful new businesses in the world uh, based in California, is run by a South African. Uh, he brings a different thinking and a different perspective than perhaps Californians would bring. Uh, California benefits by enabling a South African to be one of their leading business players. Japan in the future will benefit by being more global, not just in welcoming foreigners to come and visit Japan, but really integrating more people from other parts of the world into the management of its next generation of companies. I spent five years living in Japan, uh, working there first as a student and later as a, a member of a large Japanese corporation. Uh, one of the things that impressed me most about the Japanese was how organized folks are and how, how careful and, and effective Japanese are at carrying out the plans that they make. Uh, I remember being struck one day looking at plans to expand the transportation system in Tokyo. There was a new subway station that uh, they planned to build, according to the plan, 30 years in the future. Um, nobody in Boston plans 30 years in the future, and I was just struck by how thoughtful and uh, far-seeing the Japanese can be. Um, at the same time, I think that that ability to plan and be organized can work against Japanese because things are changing so quickly in the world today that sometimes they're not ready for the new change. Something may have happened yesterday that means I need to have a different business plan today. Uh, the emergent strategy, I think, is probably where Japan is weakest. And uh, I look forward to introducing some global entrepreneurial culture into Tokyo uh, at our facility, at our CIC Tokyo facility, so that Japanese and non-Japanese can be working alongside each other and really learning from each other, learning from what's strongest for each of them. If you're an established company in Japan, uh, seeing innovation happening around the world and looking to be relevant in the next generation of technology. One of your chief challenges is, how do I get good at that? One of them is to work more with startups themselves. Well, uh, we're naturally uh, careful about working with a brand new company that might not have a track record. We also recognize that these new companies are very quick, they're very nimble, and they can explore new ideas much faster uh, than a big company has. So. Companies in the United States are looking at startups as a form of research and development. In fact, there's a new word that I've heard recently called external R&D. Uh, traditionally, R&D has been done internally. You have laboratories in your large company where you pursue your R&D. Now, U.S. corporations are saying, I'm going to take a portion of my R&D budget and I'm going to spend it with startups in what, for me, will be external R&D. 
I will learn just as much as I could learn from my internal labs. If something is very successful, I may use a little bit more money and buy that startup so that what they've innovated becomes part of my company. But in the meantime, I'll get the power and quick moving capability of these new enterprises. Uh, so that's probably the most successful American approach uh, that uh, large companies use to remain innovative.